One of my favorite features of this podcast and of my work in general is that I keep getting surprised. And along the way, I keep learning and I meet fascinating people like Tarmo Jurista. Tarmo is hard to describe. These days, he's heading an NGO called SALC in the Baltic state called Estonia. Among other things, they are studying and forecasting elections, which is how we met, actually, and ended up collaborating with PyMC Labs, our Bayesian consultancy. But Tarmo is much more than that. Born in 1971, in what was still the Soviet Union, he graduated in finance from Tartu University. He worked in finance and investment banking until the 2009 crisis, when he quit and started a doctorate in cultural studies. He then went on to write for theater and for TV, teaching literature, anthropology, and philosophy. He's also an avid world traveler, and he teaches kendo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. As you'll hear in the episode, after lots of adventures, he established SALC, his current NGO, and they just used a Bayesian hierarchical model with post-stratification to forecast the results of the 2023 Estonian parliamentary elections and target the campaign efforts to specific demographics. Oh, and one more thing. Termo is a fan of the show. Yeah. I told you he's a great guy. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 83, recorded April 11, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. For any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedstats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hello my dear agents i have been working a lot these days on improving what we offer to the fantastic patrons of this show so if you go to patreon.com slash learn stats you'll see all the new perks but in short now i'm doing monthly ask me anything office hours You can also join one of our modeling webinars. We had a blast last week doing the first one about BART models with Samir Deshpande. And you can also enjoy my behind the scene video documentaries when I do on-site episodes. For instance, I just released the first one about modeling shark species in the Galapagos. So, if that sounds interesting, go to patreon.com slash stats and choose your favorite tier. And you know what? That's exactly what Gergely, Juhash, Marcus Nolke, Maggie McIntosh and Grant Petzolesi did. Thanks a lot for your support, folks. You really made my day and I'm looking forward to talking with you in the Slack channel. Okay. Now, let's talk hierarchical multinomial regressions with Tarmo Jurista. Tarmo Jurista, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. And how bad was my Estonian pronunciation of your name? Kind of used to this, uh, so you're actually doing pretty good. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think you told me once to how to pronounce your name, so I thought like I tried to remember. But yeah, so basically because, 
we're going to talk a lot about that in the episode, but basically we know each other from a project we've worked on. So you've contacted us at PMC Labs and uh, you had a very interesting electoral polling project where we ended up doing very fun things with hierarchical multinomial models, multi-level regression with post-ratification because you have very good polling data and census data in Estonia, which was awesome for me to work on. So the nerd in me, thank you a lot for this opportunity. And uh, and then on your own afterwards, you folks added some Gaussian processes to all of that. So this is already the summary for the listeners that we're going to talk about the, the fun stuff. And we're going to go a bit more into the details uh, because you've already actually been in a PIMC meetup, the meetups that we regularly do, PIMC Labs meetups. And I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes of the episodes. But yeah, over there, we talked a bit more about the, the whole context and how we work together. So here, what we'll do today is more going into the, the weeds of the model, but also very interestingly, how you used the model, because I found that super interesting. The model was actually super helpful and very critical in how you ended up setting up campaigning for Estonian elections this year in 2023. So we'll talk about all that. But first, as usual, can you tell us about your personal background, Darmo? Because you have a very interesting background because you've done a lot of things in your life. So yeah, like, can you tell us how you actually ended up in that nerdy world of uh, stats and uh, political science now? I guess in a way I have been in that you know, different kinds of nerd, nerdy worlds uh, throughout my life. So I was born in Estonia in 1971. Back then, it was Soviet Union, and uh, from the uh, the school days, I was I was a math nerd. So I, I was really into mathematics. This is something which I found really interesting and fascinating. I was into board games, uh, into throughout my life into you know martial arts or anything and uh, everything. I it, it really you know what I get fascinated about. I really tend to uh, dig into uh, in a deep way, and uh, I guess this is uh, how how I now, now also feel about the Bayesian statistics and, and modeling, forecasting, all these things. Uh, the background is uh, the educational background is that I uh, graduated from Tartu University in uh, economics in finance, in more specific. That was already uh, about thirty years ago. Uh, so back then, I had a few semesters of you know linear algebra and maths and and statistics and and everything like this. Uh, but um, as I recently uh, found out, uh, things have changed a bit over the uh, the last thirty years. So uh, I've had to pretty much relearn all of that. But uh, yeah, uh, just to skip a whole bunch of things. Uh, in the end of 2020, I was um, the head of the think tank in Estonia, Praxis, called Praxis. And um, at the same time, we had a, um, a government where uh, our far right party was uh, one of the coalition partners, and they were successful throughout different kinds of uh, happenings. Uh, forcing the uh, the marriage equality referendum, which was a, a bit of an issue because Estonia, being a former Eastern Bloc country, is not quite as um, progressive in terms of, uh, you know, civil liberties and, and, uh, and gay rights in, in particular as uh, the Western Europe. And uh, the, the short time we had for the referendum meant that it's, uh, it was very, very hard to pull together a uh, successful campaign. However, we organized, we tried to get into it. And then uh, again, to cut a few uh, bits and pieces, uh, the long sh uh, story short, the, uh, the referendum never happened. It got called off in the 12th hour. But we were already there, we were organized, and we figured that uh, we're, we'll be continuing. And that's how we uh, we got into uh, this organization that we're, uh, we're running now. And this is, how, in the end, how we basically met met with you in Tallinn. Yeah, that's, um, thanks for that uh, short summary <laughs> of, a, of a, a story I know is longer. Yeah, and I also want to say that you... Also did some screenwriting. You've had a very, very diversified career 
that's really interesting. We talked about that when I was in Tallinn and uh, that was super interesting to, to exchange on all that. So to dive in a bit more into Bayes, do you remember when you first got introduced actually to Bayesian statistics? Now, this is a little more difficult thing to point, uh, pin down uh, precisely. In the abstract terms, I think the first time I, I really took um, significant notice of Bayesian statistics was uh, probably about 10 to 15 years ago when there was a you know brief period of my life when I was taking playing poker quite seriously. And at that time, uh, this was a very interesting, uh, interesting time in poker as well, that uh, the, the way how the game was approached was changing very rapidly from the old uh, days of, you know, smoky card rooms back in Las Vegas to uh, internet poker, uh, where lots of people were starting uh, to use the, uh, the statistical tools to anal analyze the game, to figure out their own uh, leaks in the game. And uh, there was lots of interesting theory being uh, produced in a pretty short span of time. So people started thinking about poker hands, not in terms of, of uh, you know, the particular hand you have rather than the ranges of hands or as, you know, you would say in statistics, the distribution of hands rather than the, uh, the point value. And so you would uh, start balancing your distributions against those of your opponents and think in terms of the expected value of not your single hand rather than a, a distribution of hands that you would play in uh, any particular spot. And then you would have things like game theory, optimal play, and all these. And I was, I was uh, at the at the time when I was playing. Of course, these things help you to uh, play well and and you know make money or not lose quite as much money as you otherwise would. But uh, this was something that I found really fascinating, also in abstract terms, the 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 way how we change your your thinking. And then there was a really one you know seminal book that came out uh, many years ago by. Bill Chen and Jared Ack Ackerman, I think was the uh, uh, his name, which was called Mathematics of Poker. And this was very Bayesian. So they were explicitly Bayesian in, in their approach. And I guess this must have been the first time when I actually really you know, got thinking about Bayesian statistics in, in specifically Bayesian terms. Because as I was saying, back when I was in university 30 years ago, then the statistics, as far as I can remember, everything we were taught was, was frequentist. So this was, um, there was no Bayesian stats. I can guess. And so like basically these, I mean, I'm not surprised that basically diving into poker, poker helped you then discover base. Did that help you, actually? Well, yeah, obviously it does. I mean, it's it's something, uh, of course, people are imperfect in terms of their application of, of the uh, statistical principles, and then people are really bad randomizers and uh, all of that. But uh, the way how it, I think the most valuable thing from uh, from that period of, uh, of my life was, was not really uh, just, you know, related to poker, but the way how this kind of approach changed my thinking outside of poker. Uh, the way how you think about randomness, the, uh, the way how you think about chance, the way how you think about, in many ways, life in general. So rather than thinking about uh, things that happen in terms of you know point estimates or point values, you think of them as ranges of, of different things that could have happened. And then uh, uh, that will... Yeah, it will limber up the way how you, um, how you look at a wide range of things, not just uh, playing cards. Yeah. I completely agree. It's, uh, that's the cool thing of that framework is that it's a tool that you can use in a lot of any endeavor that you have where you need to think, which is a lot, a lot of cases. You know, by the way, I, I even use the Bayesian stats, uh, kind of thinking, uh, when I'm doing martial arts nowadays. So, uh, <laughs> when you're, uh, this is the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, so it's submission grappling. And, uh, in a way, this is also, I, I teach it as well. And, um, I don't teach it this way necessarily to beginners, but uh, in more advanced uh, groups, um, you can think of a fight like uh, a stochastic process. So you don't know what your opponent is going to do, but you have a range of things that they can do. And some of the things are more likely or less likely. And uh, so you have your, your priors. You, you have an idea of things that could happen. And then you incorporate the information that you gain over the uh, the encounter to narrow these uh, these things and in a way what you try to do when you're fighting your opponent or you know when you're playing poker or you know chess or 
whatever board game, uh, you narrow your opponent's options while keeping yours as, as flexible as, as possible. And this is, uh, I could go on about this, you know, long, long, long way, but, you know, this is just an example that you can use the Bayesian approach to uh, randomness or to unknown things in a much broader way than uh, people would probably usually recognize. Yeah, for sure. And and the fact that also the, the perception and, and priors are ingrained in the brain with without us even noticing consciously. And this is actually something that I find fascinating. And I have started doing a, a, a bit of readings on these. So <laughs> the results is at least episode 77 with Pascal Wallish, where we talk about that and especially how to explain like these, you know, percept different perceptions of colors, especially with the dress from 2016 that some people are seeing as gold and white, even though it's black and blue. And so why actually some people see it like that. And that was, that's a fascinating episode. Pascal dove in, dug in, like did a lot of research about that. And also episode 81, which uh, is with Alan Stocker and uh, talk about perception of visual speeds and how it's actually related also to priors and um, prior experiences and things like that without us even noticing that computation going on because otherwise like we would be <laughs> crippled by decision decision uncertainty and paralysis so it's yeah definitely super interesting and extremely useful and and prevalent in everyday life and actually now can you tell us basically what you do <laughs> uh, how would you define the work you're doing nowadays and the topics that you are particularly interested in well as i was saying in the introduction uh, we set up uh, the organization that we have the foundation for a uh, you know particular reason for fighting the uh, the referendum and for this uh, as we uh, we were really short uh, short of time uh, we figured that uh, we have to move really quickly, try to get an idea of what the uh, the public opinion is on this issue, and then see what we can do to tilt it towards the uh, the outcome that uh, we were looking for. And now this is a kind of a general problem, of course, not only to uh, ref in pertaining to referendums, but also to elections. That um, the function of the outcome of a referendum or an election is actually you know a function of a uh, number of different variables uh, the most important ones would be you know in case of election that would be the people's party preference and the other would be turnout uh, because uh, whether you agree with something or or disagree with something is of no consequence if you do not show up and cast your vote and so this is something that we got into first. We figured that since there was a less than six months to the planned date of the referendum, then there's not going to be a whole lot of time to uh, change people's opinions because, you know, based on all the available literature, you can change people's minds, but uh, it's hard to do that overnight. So it, it takes time. And however, it is oftentimes much easier to change people's behavior. So you can, uh, you can try and, uh, and uh, motivate people to get out and, and cast their vote, or you can, uh, you can try and um, give them, you know, good enough reasons to stay at home or, or not show up and, uh, and, and get involved. So this was something that we were, were first um, trying to look into. But just as I, I said before, the election uh, never materialized, but we had already gotten started with uh, this idea. And then we said, OK, so the, the problem is still there. So we, uh, we, we still have the far right party in the government. And uh, even although the, the, um, the government uh, fell apart, so but we still have them in the parliament, they could easily be in the in the government. And if you look at what's been going on in Europe, then this is a very general thing everywhere that the far right is uh, gaining strength throughout the uh, the continent. Now, however, when we were looking, we started our monthly uh, service streams. So we started getting the data in, building the uh, the time series, and then pretty much immediately we noticed something which is is actually quite obvious, of course, once you once you see it. And this is something that is true throughout the uh, all of the Europe. 
contrary to uh, UK and US, where you have basically two party systems, most of the Europe is, is multi party systems, where you have uh, coalition governments. And this presents you with a, you know, particular kind of a, a problem. It is also there in case of uh, UK and US, but in a slightly different than perhaps a little less pronounced form. And what I'm getting to is that if you look at the uh, the setup of the political landscape in all of these uh, Western European countries, then you can easily see that the uh, the liberal uh, side of the, uh, the polity is highly fragmented and has been this way for, uh, for a long time. Uh, however, the far right in most of the uh, European countries tends to be uh, pretty unified or, you know, they are not split. Oftentimes it's just because it's just one party like Northern League in Italy or, you know, like uh, True Finns in, uh, in Finland or Swedish Democrats in Sweden or whatever. But it's also, it carries over to the, uh, the side of the voters. And uh, what I have in mind there is that if you look at the uh, the way how the um, the voters' opinions cluster, then uh, the far right tends to have no competition for their core voters, while the liberal parties tend to share their you know core voters not by the uh, the party affiliation, the way how people like to express how they intend to vote, but in terms of if you look at the um, people's political opinions or preference on, on issues like immigration or, you know, women's rights or environment, uh, climate crisis, all these, then the liberal cluster is split between a number of different parties. And now this is something that got me and got us with, you know, the team that we have thinking that uh, what we're facing here is actually a pretty uh, basic coordination problem. So the liberal parties compete with each other but the far right doesn't really. Far right only competes with liberal parties. And um, in a way, this is inevitable in politics because in parliamentary politics, politicians see the politics as a zero-sum game. And uh, they actually have pretty good justification for this because, you know, the number of seats in the parliament, whichever country, is a set number. So it's it's not flexible. And this means that any, any seat that someone else takes is a seat that you do not get. And uh, this is a very uh, disincentivizing for cooperation or even coordination between the parties. And this is a handicap for, for liberal parties going into elections and running their campaigns. This can take a number of different guises. So it can be, you know, there are, you know, different type of, uh, of toy games or situations. So you can have like, you know, battle of sexes or, you know, uh, the tragedy of commons type of things where sometimes, you know, people would like to coordinate for a certain kind of a result as a uh, possibility for a coalition, but uh, their own selfish interests drive them against this uh, optimal result. So they all arrive at suboptimal result. And so this was the uh, the issue that uh, slowly emerged, or actually pretty quickly emerged when we started looking at the data. And then we started figuring that, um, trying to figure out what can we do about it? And the rest is history, like they say. So uh, this got us embarked on a very, very interesting uh, process during which also our roads crossed. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. And I think it's a pretty good segue to then start talking about what you recently did and how the, the model was used. So for the listeners, can you tell us basically what happened, like which kind of elections just happened in Estonia and how did your work with the NGO SALC basically fit into that? And then we'll get into the Bayesian model part of the project. Well, we had a um, regular parliamentary elections uh, scheduled for uh, 2023. So um, this is something that we did set our sights on already in uh, 2021. And so actually we had another election in 21, which was the uh, local municipal elections. So this was something where we were testing some of the ideas and some of the approaches and figured out what we would need to do differently or additionally on top of what we were doing. And then uh, we, we pretty much set our sights yes to 2023 election, which took place a little less than a month ago now, the 5th of March. 
and uh, just to you know spoil the surprises for anyone who wants to Google what happened in Estonia, then uh, the the liberal side of the uh, the politics uh, won pretty much landslide. It was expected to be a tightly contested uh, election between the uh, the conservative and liberal part, and the conservative one was including the uh, the far right party that I mentioned before. But in the end, the Liberal side won 60 seats of our uh, 101 uh, seat parliament. So it's a very comfortable uh, uh, majority uh, uh, government that is uh, was supposed to uh, step into the office today. They will probably do that tomorrow because the uh, the far right party was setting up a filibusters and, and delaying things. But it's all done now. And so yes, this was something where we um, we leveraged the data on one hand to extent that we could. But, you know, tying back to what I was saying just before, and this is something, well, we might want to revisit in a greater detail at some point, but, you know, I just want to outline it here and say that although the data and the model were really instrumental, were really important in getting the result that we uh, we did, in a way, it was a, a little bit of a smoke screen. We used the data and we used the model to give a common reference point to the liberal parties. And this in itself will help people to, or will actually push people to cooperate. So if they see the same data, if they see the same picture, and they have the, you know, the basic alignment about the, uh, the facts of the situation, then uh, the coordination just happens inevitably. So you do not need to coordinate people. You don't need to tell them where to go and what to do. They will start doing that by themselves if the data is coordinated. And uh, this is something which was a, you know, perhaps when looking at the uh, at the end result, and we have been doing a bit of the interviews trying to assess our, our impact. It is hard to say, of course, because uh, much of it is a uh, not direct. It's, uh, it's through different vectors and different venues. But looking at the the end result uh, what we're really happy about is that uh, the end result is exactly what we were aiming for i can't tell how much of it is because of us but it was exactly what we were aiming for meaning that all the liberal parties all three liberal parties punched well above their weight in terms of they outperformed the polling uh, expectations, they outperformed the expectations of of experts, and all the parties on the other side uh, underperformed the expectations. And this is something which gave the, um, the 60 seats. So if only the uh, Reform Party that won the election, who got 37 seats, if only they had performed well while, you know, cannibalizing the vote share of other liberal parties, then uh, you wouldn't have had the landslide uh, the way we did. But what was really good thing about it is that uh, there was a solid, strong performance throughout the liberal front. Yeah, fascinating. And definitely that's something we were going to get back to when we talk about more the of the, basically, the usage of the model. I find that super interesting, basically, this idea that just having a reliable and trustworthy outside source of data and and modeling helps you solve the prisoner's dilemma, basically, that you were talking about a few minutes ago. And that basically, instead of fighting on whether there is a, pro a problem, then parties can coalesce and be like, okay, there is a problem and let's agree on how to solve it which of course is way more efficient. They collaborate on the solution instead of fighting in the first place over whether there is a problem or not. So definitely let's go back to that. But first, let's talk about the model. And before that even, so you were saying that there was quite a substantial polling error. Basically the polls ended up being biased, statistically biased towards the right parties. So that means that the, the left parties have been underestimated. So I'm actually wondering what was the magnitude of that error and how did the model cope with that? Like, was it a, an error that the model had actually anticipated in the way that in, in the uncertainties that it was calculating, this kind of polling error was already 
taken in. And so that way, the fact that you had a Bayesian model with uncertainties made your predictions way more robust than just taking an average of polls, for instance. And now, this is, of course, a huge subject, and we could easily talk an hour about uh, all the details and nuances here. But uh, let's try and then uh, and put a finger on, on a few more important things. So first of all, it was a really strange uh, situation in Estonia in the last weeks uh, leading to uh, the election. Because um, Estonia is a small country, we do not have uh, you know, a huge number of pollsters covering the elections like you would have in the United States, where there's literally dozens of them running different surveys all the time. I don't know how, ma- how many there are in, 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 in France, for instance, if, uh, if you were... Oh, about eight. Depends on the elections, but between... Uh, not a lot. It's not the US. <laughs> yeah, in Estonia, it's, it's pretty much free. So three different pollsters, uh, and they are all international ones with local uh, uh, representations. And what happened was that, you know, their numbers were diverging wildly in the last two, uh, two weeks going into the election. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, nobody has, has really, uh, to that moment, uh, figured out uh, what exactly went wrong there. Of course, every pollster is standing by their guns and saying that we did everything right. And uh, But, you know, there was a literally, in within the single week, what was the, the most volatile was actually exactly the, the support or the implied support of the far-right party. We had a situation where the, the same pollster reported more than 10 percentage point difference between two subsequent weeks. And we had different pollsters reporting more more than 10 percentage point difference in the party support within the same week. The support was somewhere, you know, depending on whom you, you were believing, either in the neighborhood of 15 percent or 25 percent. It's a huge swing. I am personally uh, suspicious, uh, very suspicious of the data quality there. So uh, it just, you know, we, we all know we, we work with the survey data and you know that, you know, mistakes happen. And even if the uh, mistakes do not happen, then you can literally have, you know, an outlier uh, survey. You can have a bad survey, as you as you as you call it, say that, you know, you try your best. Uh, you have your uh, your uh, survey uh, cells, which you try to to fill, you you try to keep the, uh, the sample representative and all this, but you know sometimes you just end up in a in a long tail of distribution and and you get skewed results. I don't know which was the case there, but you know these numbers literally did not make sense going into the uh, the election. So this is the backdrop for this. However, now even when you take a longer view going into the uh, the election then the model that we will be talking about the uh, the MRP model that Alex and the the team at PyMC Labs helped to uh, develop for us was uh, in the retrospect I can tell that it was uh, it was all the time predicting uh, giving better predictions in hindsight than the polls were showing so our model showed the uh, the party that was actually winning the uh, the election predicted constantly uh, between between uh, 33 to 35 to 36 seats, it ended up winning 37, which was a uh, big surprise for everyone. However, the polls were averaging uh, around uh, 29 to 31 uh, seats. So it's a substantial difference. However, it is hard to be sure, you know, it might be that, you know, something changed people's opinions in the uh, tail end of the uh, the campaign. And there were a few things that were, were breaking at that time. And also, I have a suspicion that this whole confusion about the ratings uh, helped also us to mobilize the voters to drive them out and say that it's a really tightly contested election, although we pretty much knew that it wasn't. But you can still make that point and drive people out to vote. This is something that now leads me to a second important point there is that the model that we uh, uh, we talk about really only tried to figure out the latent support of the parties in the population. We did not get into the turnout modeling. And this is something which uh, was a uh, was a huge factor in this election because uh, in 2023, 
in Estonia, about 10% more people showed up to vote than in the last election. So it's, a, again, a substantial difference. And uh, it seems uh, that uh, we, we still do not have the, uh, the full breakdowns of the um, uh, people who, who did vote, the statistics. But it does seem that the activity spike or the additional turnout was definitely uh, not uniformly distributed. So it was benefiting the Liberal parties uh, by a lot. And that's, again, something that we did not even, well, I shouldn't say we didn't try. We tried to model what we, what we failed because um, we had very low confidence in uh, this uh, uh, modeling because, you know, unfortunately, uh, elections are pretty rare events. So you, uh, you cannot observe them every weekend and then draw your inferences. And uh, because they happen every four years, then also the context tends to be very different between different elections and your, you'd be really hard pressed to find the uh, your priors that you can rely on from four years ago. But that's interesting. So, I mean, <laughs> here from the mother's standpoint, if you want to convince people of the importance of a model, you seem to have had the perfect, you know, circumstance, which I've been dreaming of that circumstance in France for a long time <laughs> to try and convince uh, French, at least journalists, that just making an average of polls is not is not the best and that's why it's different to do a mo to make a model etc but uh, yeah basically if the if the model ends up being way closer to the election than the conventional wisdom and the polls that really helps driving the point home that you need some serious modeling because these are extremely complicated events to forecast and just your intuition is usually fall short is usually going to fall short even though you can be an extremely smart person So yeah, like quite happy. <laughs> But you know, as a proper Bayesian, you would also obviously uh, recognize that we might have just been I lucky. <laughs> if, uh, the results fell this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just more talking from a marketing standpoint here, even a politics standpoint. But yeah, for sure. Like that's just the first election. And so I'm really looking forward for your next elections that you're going to try that type of models. And I mean, for sure, if you try going to other countries also and doing the same, you should, <laughs> that will increase your sample size of elections, uh, even though that these will be different countries. And yeah, I mean, the first thing I would do as the model here is like trying and understand if like, if there is a good reason why the model actually differed from the polls and the conventional wisdom. I think to me, that would be the most interesting because uh, maybe the model was just lucky because it was biased in some ways, like, you know, like in the variance bias trade-off, it was more biased than variable. And so in that case, it was lucky, but maybe the next time it won't. So yeah, like that would, like they, this pendulum basically all the time is the hard thing when trying to place the slider between overfitting and underfitting, especially when you don't have a, a lot of, a, a big sample size, as you were saying, is extremely, extremely important. But Yeah, I'm like quite happy to hear about all these uh, these successory based on uh, Bayesian data science modeling. That's absolutely awesome. And so as you were saying, we could continue talking about that. But I think now is a good point to actually dive a bit deeper into the model because that will help listeners understand basically what the model was doing and why also it could have been more efficient than the rest of the methods. And I mean, I do have a bias here because I mean, I worked on the model. And also I do think that these kind of methods are actually better at trading between overfitting and underfitting. And so in the long term, this kind of method will usually give you better predictions than other methods that are either too biased or too variable. But basically these are my priors and, and bias, biases. But yeah, can you tell us a bit about the structure of the model. First, the, like the Bayesian structure, and then we will talk a bit more about how we made that even better with MRP. Mm -hmm. So uh, even before we dive deep into the uh, the model itself, I would like to set one thing straight there and say that, you know, uh, this was definitely the case uh, with us, but I think it's also something which would apply in a, in a bit more universal, broader way. We did not use the the model and we didn't even you know suggest using i actually suggested against using it for predicting the elections this is something which 
again, would take a lot of more looking into it. But say, in the case, if it was, just to give an example, if it was a really tightly contested election, so it was basically a coin flip, and you built the mo a model that would uh, give you a correct prediction, uh, who wins, then I would say that if it really is a coin flip type of model or type of situation, then your model's prediction is pretty useless. Because, you know, the distribution, if, if the mean is right in the center, center of, of the, uh, the outcomes, you know, if you were right, then it was just luck. So uh, predicting coin flips is not something that you should use a Bayesian model for. However, what you can use a Bayesian model for is determining whether the situation you're facing is it indeed a coin flip or is it a, it's, it's a lopsided situation. And this is something where the Bayesian model can give you lots of really good in input. And this is where we get into uh, the importance that you were also referring to before, that the model can give you that the uh, just, you know, averaging the survey results wouldn't because the if you average the survey results, you end up with a point estimate, and this can be either right or wrong. But uh, that's not in itself a hugely uh, useful piece of information. However, if you do get also the uncertainty estimate with this, then you can make, you know, much more informed calls, whether this is, you know, the right place where you actually want to, you know, send your resources to, whether this is a, you know, hill to die on, or whether this is something that you should just, you know, leave, leave aside because, you know, there's a, a snowball's chance in, uh, in hell to, um, uh, to get a mandate from that district. This is uh, one of the, uh, the important things to keep in mind. Now, what we try to do, the other thing we try to do with the, uh, the model. And, and the that's model, again just something I'm that interrupting you, were, you here, but um, the model has access to previous elections, like, the difference with like the just averaging is just like the, you you train the model on previous elections. So if you structure it in a way where the model can actually learn from history, something you cannot do with just simple averaging. That is true. That is also absolutely true. And now the the other thing that the model lets you, uh, well, we were using our monthly survey waves were with the uh, sample size was uh, 1200 observations. So this is not a, you know, huge thing, but for Estonia, this is a pretty standard one. So across the whole country, it gives you a pretty good idea of where things are. But as soon as you start zooming in into specific districts or into specific, you know, social demographic groups, then the data very quickly gets very noisy. So it's, it's very, there's just simply not enough observations and your monthly observations start to fluctuate by a lot. So it is something that you basically cannot just rely on. And uh, if you, let's say, if you, uh, the example that I've, I've used also in the, um, in the meetup that uh, Alex was referring to before is that uh, if you take the second large city in, in Estonia, which is Tartu, and then you take the, the male citizens, and then you take the second largest uh, or the, the, the main ethnic minority, which is Russian speaking people, then you are left with the sample size of four out of initial 1200. And this is obviously something that, you know, you cannot work with. But uh, the, the point is that you can, with a model, you can. With a survey data, you cannot. But uh, with the survey data, you act like a Martian who's been, you know, stranded to uh, to planet Earth first time, uh, put down to city of Tartu and shown uh, four uh, Russian-speaking males uh, asked to uh, tell, uh, make any sense out of this situation. But we can rely on the signal that we can pick up from the whole sample. So we have 1,200 observations, 20% of which are Russian speakers. About 8% uh, of them live in the city of Tartu. And so you can borrow the signal from other parts of the population if you have right idea what drives people's political preferences, opinions. And now this is where we get to the model. So this is how we uh, set it up because we had a uh, bit of a uh, hypothesis, but uh, we had pretty good idea what are the main determinants of people's political preferences, not just the party preferences, but also the underlying political ideas that cause people to prefer one party over the other. And uh, in Estonian case, uh, we figured out or we've found that there are four main things that determine these opinions. So those would be uh, age, gender, education and ethnicity. These are the four main ones. 
And there are, of course, important uh, interaction effect, effects between those as well. But if you know these things about a person, then you can pretty easily construct, you know, likely distributions of their political opinions. And of course, each and every person's concrete opinions can vary within these distributions. But we're not concerned about predicting, uh, you know, preferences of a single person. We're concerned of making uh, inferences across uh, bigger distributions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the the Bayesian structure comes into place, right? So can uh, can you do you want to talk a, a bit about that, or uh, should I give the rundown, basically, of how? how that kind of modeling could work. I can try and give from my side the uh, uh, the overview of, of, of yeah, the structure. Yeah. So that basically, basically, obviously, this is, uh, we, we did not invent the wheel. So this is the uh, the type or the structure of the model, which has been used for quite 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 long number of years. Uh, so it's called MRP, the multi-level regression with post stratification, where we pick up, let's take them, you know, one letter at a time. So the multi-level is basically just the, uh, it refers to hierarchical structure of the model. And let's leave it aside for a moment. Let's get back to this. So the R is regression. And this refers to the point that I was making before, that we we have a model that learns the relationships between these four factors that I mentioned before, the age, uh, gender, education, and ethnicity. The model learns how these things affect or tilt or, uh, you know, somehow influence people's political preferences, yeah, opinions. And then also looks at the way how these different factors interact in these influences. And then they have a pretty good idea what each and every component of these, uh, these, these four do. So it's kind of like levers that you, you can slide to one side or the other. And then it's, it's a very multi-dimensional data space that this thing unfolds in. But basically this is how it works. And then the post stratification part is that once you put the, the multi-level and the regression parts together. And multi-level is then uh, something which I was referring to before, saying this Martian thing, that uh, you can borrow the signal of gender, ethnicity, uh, whatever else, education, from the like groups elsewhere in so we had a, this what you were referring to yourself alex as a russian doll, doll type of structure where the uh, it's a nested structure where the uh, we had a small geographical units kind of local districts that were grouped into electoral districts and that were then grouped into the whole population and so the model keeps them separate but allows you to learn across the uh, the divisions of um, these geographical divisions. And then post stratification is the final bit, which I think was also pretty important for the uh, the end results being uh, that way they were. We were kind of lucky that uh, Estonia had its full census about a year ago, so half a year before we started working with the model. So we had a fresh, high quality census data that we could just uh, get from the statistics office for you know a couple of like 20 bucks and then have model to de-bias the inputs from the survey and scale them to the population. And this does a number of things. So first of all, yes, it debiases the estimates, but this also allows you to simulate the uh, the population. And then instead of working, you know, like I was giving the uh, the example before about Tartu and uh, you know four Russian males, you can simulate the actual number of uh, Russian-speaking males in Tartu. And then, you know, dice and slice them whichever way you like, uh, group them, uh, uh, figure out, uh, you know, s isolate a further narrower category of age groups within this broader demographic and make inferences about this. And you get the inferences together with uh, your uncertainty estimates, which is, again, hugely important and, and useful. So this is the overview of the uh, how, how the MRP model is, uh, is set up. But uh, I guess we can we can get into a lot more more detail there. So also, like you were saying before, we added the GP part. So this is uh, this is something which was a crucial crucial component. Yeah. So uh, we'll dive into yeah we'll talk a bit about the the GPs in a minute, and, and then we'll dive into how you concretely use the model during the campaign because it will also help people understand the the how powerful these kind of 
models can be. And just so to summarize what you just said with the model structure is that, yeah, what you observe are poles, row poles that you conduct with your partners in the NGO. And then you get those row poles, which is extremely valuable because uh, me, that was the first time I got the opportunity to work on really row poles like that. It was not poles that were reported by, draw, by newspapers or else, which is what usually I use for French electoral forecasting. But here you get access to the row poles. And so you do that multinomial regression part where the model basically is trying to do that multinomial choice uh, simulation. And based on that, well, base formula comes in, we observe poles, and the model tells you, well, based on the data I've observed and on the priors and the structure of the model, which is reflecting your domain knowledge, I think that the true latent popularity of the parties in the population is this, and you get a distribution for each party. But as you are saying, we're observing poles, and even though we're also doing a regression using the social demographics, demographical factors that you talked about, and we trained the model in previous elections, this is still a biased sample of the population because it's a poll. And so afterwards comes the uh, post-stratification part that you talked about that was invented by Andrew Gelman and, and other very smart people. And basically, this is kind of a magic thing that is so easy in a way to do in the Bayesian framework, right? Um, just now that we fit the model, you tell the model, well, now imagine that we observe these data, which are extremely reliable data because they come from their census data. And in Estonia, you have an incredibly detailed uh, census data, which then you can use and then tell the model, okay, based on these data that we trust now, make the predictions on what we learned previously from the polling data. And now you have your debiased estimates that you're talking about, and you are able to make predictions even for very low sample sizes of the population. Like, so as you were saying, Russian speaking males in Tartu, maybe a um, uh, low education Russian speaking males, and then you can you can dive into the you can slice your your population into strata, whatever you want. But since you have your census data, then you're able to actually make predictions, which also makes sense to you as the domain expert, which was the amazing thing. And the uncertainty is actually workable, right? It's not an uncertainty that's like, oh yeah, well they think we should like the Estonian government, I don't know, should invest more in education with a probability of 10 to 70%, <laughs> which is actually unactionable. This was actually very actionable probabilities. And to me, that was magic. Like, here's, like I know how this works mathematically, but like doing it and then seeing it in action and how that debiases your, your estimates and allow you to make predictions on, on very small data sets, it feels like magic. So that, that was incredible. And so, yeah, based in some on... All that structure, then you added Gaussian processes. So yeah, now I'll give you the, the floor again if you want to add anything to that and then just talk a bit more about the, the Gaussian processes before we go into the, the practical use of the of the model. Yeah, in, in some cases, uh, I just want to underline this, uh, what I said before about the uncertainty uh, estimates being important. In some cases, if you, you know, slice the data long enough, then eventually you get to the point where the uncertainty is going to explode. So this is just the nature of the, uh, the way how statistics works. But uh, even in these cases, it can be immensely useful because uh, when we were showing the results to the, uh, you know, so to say clients, to the, uh, the parties that we worked with, then we were drawing their attention to uh, this and saying that, you know, don't just look at the distribution means. Don't uh, disregard the uh, uh, the long tails of the distributions. So if the distribution is really wide, then you shouldn't be using, you know, a stopwatch or, or a, you know, the ruler to figure out which option is better. Then in this case, you would say they are roughly equal. But in some cases, you can figure out, even though the, the tails are long, then the, you know, the joint uh, distribution is, 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 is pretty small. Then you say that, you know, there's actually a significant difference between these two options. And I can say that with a pretty high confidence, even though the, uh, the uncertainty can be very high. 
So uh, this is, um, and I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, as you said before, that it, it looks and feels like magic. So it takes a while to get used to, especially if you come from, you know, working with just the raw survey data and then running the cross tabs and then figuring out that, you know, I think I have a signal, but I have no idea how sure, uh, certain I can be about that. So this is a very different world. And now about the GP. So the, uh, the Gaussian process part, uh, so that was really important addition. We did discuss it with you, uh, Alex, at first, but we figured that we'll, uh, we'll leave it out of the, uh, the, you know, the main version of the, uh, the model that you shipped. And the reason why it's important is that uh, if you show a model, let's say two years worth of data, and uh, that's been collected on in monthly intervals. So if you if just feed it to the the model, then the model really has no way of knowing that uh, what it is seeing is actually a time series. So it will take the the whole variance over the two year period as a continu or a simultaneous variance within the same moment. And uh, as everyone knows, the uh, the party popularity can have wild swings, especially you know at the time of uh, COVID pandemics and everything like this. So the it's been a roller coaster, and so there's a huge variety or a huge variance in the data. However, if you can tell the model and say that you know this is a time segmented uh, time series, so it's not just you know one moment that we're talking about. So the Gaussian process allows a model to uh, keep the the time period separate the same way like the hierarchical structure helps it to keep the uh, geographical units separate and still learn from this and not mix everything up keep the important distinctions but pick up the uh, the useful signal and that is what the uh, the Gaussian process gave us so once we added this then uh, the uncertainty came down we could uh, make even if we wanted to we could make predictions into the future although then as you well know the uh, the, uh, the uncertainty is, is going to explode very quickly but it will let the model to learn much more precisely yeah Exactly. I mean, I've used those myself for, for French elections and it's definitely something you want because weirdly, if you give all the, the time, the whole time series to the model, it will be both overconfident and estimate a larger variance than needed, which is a weird combination. <laughs> but yeah, because the model is like, wait, that's weird. That party can go from 5% probability, um, popularity to 25%, which is a five-fold increase or decrease in just a few, like at the same time. This is weird uh, because the model doesn't know about time series, but the, it's not conscious of time. And at the same time, the model has a huge load of data. Because if, if you give it like, I don't know, five elections, that's actually a lot of polls. So then the model will think, well, actually, I have a lot of data. I shouldn't be very uncertain. So I should be very certain that the variance is very high, <laughs> which is exactly what you don't want. So yeah, like then... Adding, so if you're conscious of that, then you can still work with a model which doesn't have time series. So it can already be a good model, but then definitely the next installment in your modeling workflow should be, okay, how do we make the model time conscious, basically? Because it needs to know that, yeah, one party can go from 5% to 25%, but it usually happens during years and not during one election campaign. So that's where the work you did on the on the Gaussian processes, I guess, was very useful. So, okay, I think now listeners have a very good background for everything you did, and hopefully the most uh, technical listeners will feel fulfilled by the previous segment. Now, before we close up the show, because it's already late for you, I don't want to take too much of your time. Can you dive a bit into basically how you use the model and how you used it also to basically focus the campaigning efforts and the, the kind of insights that you got practically from it? I guess the most interesting and important contribution to uh, what we could offer the, uh, the parties was, uh, was something where we, uh, we did use the, the model that we were just describing, the, uh, the MRP model, as a platform for uh, uh, working with a different kind of data. So instead of the MRP model was initially uh, built to uh, predict the or discover, infer the uh, latent uh, support for parties 
in the population. But what we ended up doing was that we ran a different kind of survey, which was uh, set up as a max diff for best worst scoring. So um, just to very briefly, we had 18 different policy questions that we showed people, the respondents. Uh, we had, again, 1,200 respondents. Every one of them saw 10 times a random sample of five out of these 18. And every time they had to indicate the one that is for them most important for making the decision and the least important for making their decision. And this gives you, you know, a whole bunch of data points. So uh, this is like uh, 1,200 people giving you, you know, 10 screens. So that's already 12,000 12, um, uh, data points. And in each of those, there's five options. So this is uh, this is a lot of data that the model can dig, dig into. And w now what it discovers is not just the uh, the latent support for certain policy proposals, but it also gives you heterogeneous effects over the uh, different sociodemographic groups. And uh, it works out each and every person's sort of a latent, uh, how, to, how to say that, order of importance of these topics. And now this combined with the same Bayesian model that we used as a platform. So we, we built a couple of things on top of it. So we still use the GP. We had a little bit different regression part where it learned people's latent preferences and then allows to post stratify those across the whole population. And now this is why this was really important is that, uh, as I mentioned before, it lets you to dig into the heterogeneous effects. So you can specify, you can be very precise and figure out in this part of the, uh, the country, in general, this topic trends important, but not in this group. Let's say you may want to talk about education but not to a lower education, uh, lower educated people. Or, you know, for instance, one of the topics that uh, was very strongly uh, stratified, and this is true also in elsewhere in the world, is uh, attitudes towards nuclear energy. And this is where there's a big gender gap. Men tend to be viewed it much more favorably than, uh, than women and also tend to think it much more important than uh, women. And uh, this was really interesting because we had a uh, just Europe-wide energy crisis in the last uh, winter. So this was an important topic to figure out. And, uh, and we could tell that, you know, if you want to talk about this, talk to men, not women. And uh, we could say that, you know, don't go and talk uh, about this uh, if people's political preferences are leaning this way. Then they are probably not receptive to this, uh, this idea. And we could do that on all those different 18 different topics, we could give very price, uh, precise ideas what topics to stress and which topics to avoid when you, uh, when you talk, because this would generate a lot of very strong response from, you know, wrong kind of, uh, of people from the, uh, the campaigning point of view. And that is something that the, uh, the parties were later telling us was, uh, was hugely important or hugely useful for them for calibrating their, uh, their campaign messages and for figuring out where to go with them and, uh, and what to do with them. Hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. So basically, like, yeah, the insights you got from the post-stratified estimates afterwards are really informed which kind of demographics you should focus on to depending on the issue you were interested in talking about. Or the issue you would want to avoid from. And this is uh, equally important in the elections yeah. that you do not raise the, for instance, in US, there's a, it's a very well known thing that if the, uh, the salience of immigration issue starts trending, then this is beneficial for Republicans because the median voter tends to think that Republicans have more convincing answers to immigration if it's framed as a problem. And so Democrats should really avoid touching the uh, the immigration issue. And that was the same thing in Estonia, by the way. So we were, because uh, the, the war in Ukraine, there's lots of Ukrainian refugees in Estonia. So we could very confidently tell parties that 
it's fine to talk about providing military help to Ukraine. It's fine to talk about assisting and helping, but you do not want to uh, debate openly or pay a lot of attention to the issue of Ukrainian refugees, especially outside of big cities, because this is something which was a contentious issue for uh, for many people in the in the smaller uh, smaller parts of Estonia, and so better to avoid it. And and they did, and uh, it seems to have uh, worked out really well. Yeah, and basically this is due to the fact that here. People are not really receptive to anything that could change their view, right? It's that basically just avoid that topic because you're not going to be able to change their view for now. The views are way too entrenched and in, in their identity. And so that's basically a waste of your political capital, capital to try and do that, to talk about something else or try to tackle the issue from another standpoint, from another way of coming at the issue instead of coming right in front of these issue and just talking about refugees, for instance. Yeah, so this uh, I, I could bring other examples of this as well, but this is this is something which is immensely important in campaigning, and uh, we were using it uh, quite extensively. You know, coming back to the the start of our discussion, when you mentioned about this the the nerdy world of um, of, of Bayesian statistics and then modeling and everything like this, then I have been thinking about. Uh, back to my childhood when I was also one of the nerdy things that I was doing. I was reading lots of science fiction. So I was really uh, a big fan of all the classical science fiction. And I don't know if you have uh, read this uh, very famous uh, series, Foundation series by uh, Isaac Asimov. I'm sure some of the listener, listeners have. Uh, so yeah, this is, I've heard uh, of it. The, I've, I've just not read it. Yeah, this is the uh, the basic premise of the book is that there's this one man uh, called Harry Seldon who has uh, discovers or comes up with the uh, this whole new discipline called psycho psychohistory, which allows you to predict the future of uh, societies by uh, looking at the interactions of the people. And in you know this is something that has come back to me every now and then that. You know, in a way, of course, Asimo in Foundation Series misrepresents uh, very fundamentally the, the nature of stochastic processes and, and, and randomness and all this. But uh, in a way, the ethos of this book or the, what, what Harry Seldon is trying to do is not so unlike from the, uh, the Bayesian modeling in political context. And so you're trying to gain insight to how people would act in a certain situation. And this is like an anthill. So it's impossible to predict the trajectory of a single ant. But the totality of the anthill follows a small number of very basic fundamental heuristics. And this allows you to predict the entirety of the uh, the behavior of the anthill with surprisingly high precision. And, uh, and this is what's so fascinating about uh, uh, seeing this thing unfold. Yeah, yeah for sure. So what's the name of the of the series? I'll put that in the show notes because that sounds like a fun read. Yeah, there's a there's I think there's four or five books in that series, but it's a foundation series. Foundations. Isaac Asimov. Oh yeah. Okay. Already found it. Perfect. So I will put that into the show notes. Isaac Asimov Foundation. There's even a Wikipedia page. Perfect. Ah, oh, that sounds like fun. Probably going to read that. Yeah, try it. Cool. It's, uh, it's yeah, a famous so, book. And, and yeah, I mean, because one of the main questions I would have on that kind of optimization of what parties can and cannot say is, yeah, that's good. But then what do you do if you really have to talk about refugees? Because like, if you really want to talk about refugees and you think that it's a problem that actually you cannot talk about the fact that, well... I think that Estonia should take on more Ukrainian refugees. And what if you want to do that? And isn't that also the role of politics is to bring, bring some hot topics for, uh, for debates. And if we're not able to debate these kind of very hot topics, doesn't that mean that in the end, the incentives of our democratic institutions are maybe not, um, maybe need to be updated in a way? So yeah, like that's the main question I would get based on, on this. Well, now we're getting into politics podcast away from the statistics podcast, and uh, I would be yeah, happy to have that discussion as well. But it's more political uh, science. I think the but we're almost at the end of yeah, the discussion, the, so you know, like it's it's going to have a natural the, the, ending point. I think the the important thing to notice here is that you are free to talk 
about whatever you like, uh, but uh, this kind of model just gives you an honest estimate what the the likely outcome or you know the expected cost of of that could be, and so you can make an informed decision. If you think that this is still an important thing to to bring forth and discuss, then by all means go and do that. So this is politics. So uh, however, the statistics part it cannot tell you what your value should be. Statistics cannot tell you if you should be in favor of accepting Ukrainian refugees or, you know, draw the line somewhere. So this is a different thing. This is, uh, this is politics. This is where people have to figure out and arrive at some kind of a consensus or some kind of a working arrangement in the end. So, uh, this is not something that statistics can provide you. Statistics can tell you what is likely to happen if you uh, go down this way rather than the other. Yeah. To, to make it here, it's like the models here can tell you what the problems are, but are not the problem themselves. <laughs> so that's often something that I, I have to remind people of. It's like, you know, it's like the famous when stand up comedians often saying the joke about the horrible thing is not the horrible thing itself. And so, yeah, like the model is not the problem itself, it just reveals the problems that we may have and then we may need collectively and want collectively to do something about that. But at least the modeling can can tell you, yeah, like here there is kind of a problem. You could get an optimized solution, but maybe that's a local optimum and you might want to find another optimal which is more global. And this is important a thing to underline at the end of the the episode is that, that I don't think that the politics should or could be modeled statistically uh, from the uh, the start to the end. I think it would be a terrible idea. And in that sense, if you read the uh, Asimov's uh, foundation, then there are, you know, these darker tones there as well, which would make you think about the downsides of, 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 of such things. But that being said, statistics and modeling and Bayesian modeling can be immensely uh, useful tool for, uh, for also for doing the right thing. So, uh, uh, it's just that I want to be uh, it to be clear that what we have spoken about today in terms of modeling the people's preference, modeling election outcomes, and all of that, is is just a technical way of um, of figuring out. If you look at the uh, election as a kind of a game and say that you want to maximize your uh, your result, you want to optimize, find this local local uh, maximum, then this is what you should do. But you should always keep in mind that there's a broader world behind the models uh, that you're uh, you're working with. Yeah, it's like with the current rules of the game, here is how to optimize your gain. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't change the rules. Exactly. Okay, cool. So let's um, maybe close up the show. So I added the foundation series in the show notes. And also for we referenced a lot of concepts that we didn't really explain in this episode. And that's kind of normal because I already have episodes about all of those topics. I put them in the show notes. You'll find episodes about hierarchical models, Gaussian processes, um, non-parametric models, which are Gaussian processes also, and also MRP and missing data. So you will find all these episodes in the show notes if you want to dig deeper, which I recommend because these are very interesting topics. And so maybe I ask you the final two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. I have kind of a quick question and probably a quick answer. I'm just curious, what is the thing that surprised you the most in this whole project in this whole endeavor that we talked about? I don't know if it's a short answer. So there were, I should think about the short answer. The longer one would be that uh, I was pretty much constantly surprised uh, how much there is to learn and how much fun things you can do with, uh, you were mentioning, for instance, non-parametric models, which is something that we were considering at one point and we'll probably go down that route, uh, route and, and try. So it's 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 all like, you know, it's tinkering. It's, it's finding the different bits and pieces and then trying and most of the time you fail in one form or the other, but uh, you know sometimes you strike gold, and uh, those are the uh, the great moments. So when you you know run your MCMC sampler and uh, you know the trace plots come out perfect, and then you suddenly see something that you didn't see before, it's it's a wonderful feeling, and uh, I'm sure you know it well as well. Yeah, 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 for sure. 
I and I understand. <laughs> That's definitely an answer I could have given. Okay, so let's close up the show now by asking you the last two questions. So first one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Well, right now, I would probably, given my current knowledge and uh, leanings, I would probably uh, dedicate a lot of basically all my all my uh, time and, um, and resources to trying to figure out how to avoid the climate problems, because I think this is really, really a fundamental thing we're facing in, uh, uh, in the world. And uh, so this is something that we're also thinking of actually doing in in Estonia with uh, our models and with our other capacities. So I guess that would be the uh, the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're definitely in good company with this answer. This is a popular one. Second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? Uh, scientific mind. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think I would actually go back uh, quite a long time into the past. I think Aristotle would be a great guy to talk to. So uh, to get really to the uh, the wellsprings of the uh, uh, the Western scientific tradition. So that would be a good, mm -hmm. good choice. That sounds like fun. Yeah. And it will probably be in Greece, which is a good choice. <laughs> well, Tarmo, thank you very much. That was fascinating conversation. I really loved it. I think, I hope we struck a good balance between going very detailed and nerdy and giving people a background about European politics, especially Eastern Europe and Estonia and help people know a bit more about this country and the wonderful Bayesian statistics that you folks are making at, at SALC. So I will, as usual, put everything in the show notes and links to to your websites and things like that for people who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Tarmo, for taking the time and being on this show. I also want to thank you because um, I'm just thinking that life takes strange turns. Uh, when I started listening to your podcast two years ago or around that time, I would have never guessed that uh, I end up being hosted, uh, hosted by you or a guest on, on, on one of the episodes. So it's been, it's been great uh, working with you, great knowing you and... Um, Thanks for everything. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your uh, loyalty to the show. And for sure, when I started the show almost four years ago, I never thought that I would be a full-time Bayesian modeler <laughs> because I was actually starting learning Bayesian statistics and that's why I started the show. So yeah, for sure, life is always full of surprises. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Tomo. And... Um, See you very soon in Estonia. Okay, see you. Bye. This has been another episode of Learning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learnbayestats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.